shepherd risks and lays down his life for the sheep. But the hired servant, who merely serves for wages, who is neither the shepherd nor the owner of the sheep, when he sees the wolf coming, he deserts the flock and runs away. And the wolf chases and snatches them and scatters the flock. Now the hireling flees because he merely serves for wages and is not himself concerned about the sheep. He cares nothing for them. But I am the good shepherd. I know and I recognize my own. My own know and recognize me, even as truly as the Father knows me, and I also know the Father. I am giving my very own life and laying it down on behalf of the sheep. And I have other sheep besides these that are not as of this fold. I must bring in and call those also, and they will listen to my voice and heed my call. And so there will, and, and so there will be. They will become one flock under one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because, now, because I lay down my own life to take it back again. No one takes it away from me. On the contrary, I lay down voluntarily. I put it from myself. I am authorized and have power to lay it down, to resign it. And I am authorized and have power to take it back. These are the instructions, the orders which I have, been, which I have received as my charge from my Father. And then... He has put the spirit of prophecy in us. Yes, amen. 
go forth throughout all the world and speak life to the dry bones. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Life and peace in the mind of Jesus. Amen. Anyone have any prayer requests for Jesus ministry this morning?
going through violence. Um, also, the strategic move of the Islamic um, office that was in Washington, D.C. is moving to the Mar a Lago of all places. Um, the Lord loves his people, but that obviously does not help what's going on behind it. Um, there are a lot of parties here.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that every need that was mentioned here today has already been met. Hallelujah, Jesus. You have finished the work. Hallelujah. And we declare, hallelujah, kidneys restored. Diabetes, we rebuke it in Jesus' name. We release our faith, Lord, for healing in every area of life. Restoration, the ministry of love, the ministry of God himself. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. If you receive it, it is yours in Jesus' name. He purchased it. He already paid the price for it. Praise God. And we receive it in his name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Mike and worship team. Thank you, Suzanne, for opening on short notice. That's the way I do everything. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless all of you for being here this morning. And the young people can be dismissed. They go downstairs. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. You know, we've been talking about our identity, really. I mean, I've been talking about a lot of things, but that's been what's on my mind anyway. How, however that ends up coming out is a whole other thing, but it really is about our identity in Christ as believers. And I... There's just so much stuff that we have uh, kind of got backwards and upside down, I think, in a lot of ways. And we've focused on, on the Scripture without seeing Christ and ourselves in the Scripture mm -hmm. and made it about stuff instead of about Him yes. and then what we are in Him. If we don't see that, if we don't come from that uh, point of reference, then we, we're missing everything else. We're, we're just doing stuff that really maybe it's good things, maybe it, it helps people uh, in an emotional way, but we, we need to go by the Spirit. Anybody that's ever been in a real hard spot knows that just positive thinking isn't going to get the job done. Amen. You need the Lord, and, and uh, as was mentioned earlier, we have people that are, not here today. Listen, I, I, can, I sympathize. I understand. I know what it is to get depressed, to get bummed out, to get slapped around by the enemy. But I'm telling you, the last thing you want to do is give in. I mean, when you roll over, he isn't going to just pat you on the head and say, okay, well, you lost. No, he's going to kick you in the teeth and he's going to keep on beating you. Reminds me of the old Humphrey Bogart movie where he said some guy was going to kick him in the teeth, and then kick him in the stomach for mumbling. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of what the devil does, amen? amen? He doesn't just slap you around a little bit and then leave you alone. If he sees that you're going to yield, he's going to be on you like white on rice. Amen. He's not going to leave you alone. He's just going to keep coming and keep coming and keep coming until you take a stand. Yes. And I, I'm telling you, uh, yes. we talking about having a house of prayer great thing. They're doing, they're doing good stuff, doing what needs to be done. But I'm telling you, when you go to pray, you better be praying New Testament prayer. If you're going begging and pleading God to do something that he's already done, that's not a prayer of faith. That's a, that's a prayer of pity. And you, you're not going to get any results that way. 
You've got to know what God has, has already declared done and finished by Jesus Christ. And then you come from that position, and that's how you pray. You pray in faith based on what Jesus has done. Not pleading and begging that God's going to do something. That's not faith. faith. Faith has to be in the finished work. Faith has to be in what Christ has accomplished. Those are Old Testament prayers. When we're begging God to do something because of my goodness or because I need it desperately. Everybody's got desperate needs. And believe me, I, could, I, I bet anybody in here, I could point to anybody in here and give you the opportunity if it wasn't too personal. You've got a stuff. You've got some stuff that you need deliverance from, that you need the power of God to operate in your life. Yeah. Feeling sorry for you will not help you. No, not that I don't feel it, not that I don't have compassion, because I got my stuff too. Right. Believe me, I got it. Yes. Yes. You don't get results that way. No. You get results based on your faith in what God has done. Yes. If we could fix it, we would have fixed it by now. All of us got issues. All of us got stuff that goes on in our lives. If we had the capacity to make it all good and all right, we would have made it that way. That's, right. That's why we need God. Yes. But God is not going to come and do something for us that he's already done. Exactly. We have to pray from that position of victory. We have to pray from it is finished. Yes. We, that's the only way you can pray in faith. Praise the Lord. Forgive me for rant. But look, I, I've been in this too long to just keep listening to the same stuff and people doing the same stuff and getting the same results. You know, somebody said that's, the, that's insanity. Keep doing the same thing and thinking you're going to get a different result. That's what crazy people do. Praise the Lord. And I don't see any crazy people out here. Thank you, Alvin. Praise the Lord. The rest of you, well, I, maybe I got some doubts, but I'm not saying it. Praise God. All right, let, let, let's just get, let's get into this, all right? I want to begin, I want to start with Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and try to bring out some things that the Lord's been dealing with me about, because I know, you know, you preach and you think, well, okay, because he preached that, then he's got it all together. No, listen, God gives me stuff because I need it, not just to point the finger at you. I got the same stuff you got. I'm a human being. I got the same kind of issues that all of you have. I expected an amen from right there, but praise the Lord. <laughs> she just knows, so there's no point in it, right? But, so I'm just saying, that's everybody's got stuff. And, you know, the... Again, if you just give in to the enemy and just say, okay, well, you know, this is a long haul. Yes. Praise the Lord. It's not just one round. No. It's not just one battle. It goes on and on. As long as we're in this world, we're going to have issues to deal with. We're going to have tribulation. Yes. And the, the sooner we get to the, the understanding that he has overcome it, yes. are we going to get some victories instead of continue to be slapped around and think that, you know, well, I'll just endure it. That, that, we're, we're not supposed to be enduring. We're supposed to be overcoming. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Malachi chapter 4. I want to read the entire chapter, which is only six verses. So Malachi 4, 1 through 6. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and the judgment. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, if you read that just naturally, it sounds paranoid. Beyond that, it sounds schizophrenic. It's like we got two things going on here. 
right? Some, it's dreadful. For others, it's victory. Amen. For some, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible day. It's a dreadful day. For others, it's a great day. It's an awesome day. Amen. So the question we have to ask ourselves is which side are we on this thing? Amen? Are we the ones fearing or are we the ones rejoicing? See, the enemy's got us confused. And we're afraid of all kinds of stuff that we have no business being afraid of. We should be confident. It's not easy because we see all this stuff. And we sense it, we feel it, and we experience it and interact in the natural world with our senses. But that's not who we are. And if we don't get this, we're going to keep pretending and playing religion and church and not getting the victory and not getting what it is we're supposed to be getting. And I don't know how many different ways you can say it and say the same thing, but that's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to say the same thing in a way that isn't redundant or boring so you don't just start writing me off after the first five minutes. That's how the Old Testament ends. It ends with a warning and a promise. And it comes from the last of Israel's prophets. Remember to obey. Because Elijah is going to come and usher in the great and terrible, awesome, and freaky day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is going to bring reconciliation for some. And it's going to bring destruction for others. Now, this is real prophecy, church. Because i got to tell you, I get uncomfortable with stuff that's not real. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This isn't some TV evangelist appealing, oh, <clears throat> I sense there's somebody in the audience of 10 million with a headache. Come and touch the screen and receive your healing. We say, well, that, that is idiotic. Yes, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on in church that is just as unreal. And we don't need to be that way. No. Praise God. This is cataclysmic stuff. This isn't some game. This isn't some little, look at me, I'm really something. This is frightening. God's coming. You better get ready. People get ready. Amen. God's coming. You better get ready. That's what he's telling them. Amen. He's going to bring restoration to his people, and he's going to bring judgment. The question is that he's asking in a kind of vague way is, which one are you preparing for? Because as you think in your heart, yes. so are you. Yes. This happened. Approximately 400 years before the Gospels appear. And during that time, Israel and their faithfulness to the Gospel or to the covenant that they were under dwindles. Mm -hmm. They pick up new customs. They pick up new cultures. Now remember, this is not just about Israel. God's speaking to us today. This is a history lesson. He's trying to tell us something. Yes. So during this 400 years after this last prophecy, now their, their faithfulness to the covenant is almost null. It dwindles down. They're, they're interacting with other cultures, picking up different customs. And during that 400 years, gradually, they abandon the Hebrew language. Because you know, when Jesus comes on the scene, they're speaking almost predominantly Aramaic. Hebrew has almost become an extinct language already. And by the time that Jesus was here, not only did they speak Aramaic, but the scriptures were usually quoted from the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation and not the Hebrew translation of the Torah. 
So you can see there were all sorts of influences here that were not intended by God. This is just history. It's just fact, okay? The, pre the priestly tradition had deteriorated so much that the Jewish priests were not able to trace their lineage or their heritage back to the Aaronic priesthood, which is what the law demanded. They had to show that they were descendants of Aaron. Today we call it the Kohen. But that's what it was. And they couldn't do that. A king reigned over these people who wasn't a descendant of Jacob. He was a descendant of Esau. That was Herod. He was a descendant of the brother of Jacob, but not Jacob. The one who gave up his birthright, Esau. And that was Herod. The whole thing was corrupt. It was divided. It was a mess. And that's why it's no coincidence that Jesus picked that time and that place to show up. The prophetic ministry in Israel had ceased with Malachi. So John appears, who is Elijah, by the way. Look at Matthew chapter 17, Roberto, verses 10 through 13. disciples ask him, saying, why then say the scribes that Elijah must come first? Now they were referring back to the prophecy of Malachi. Why Elijah must first come. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed or wanted. Likewise, they're going to do the same thing to me. The Son of Man will suffer all of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. That's what was being prophesied. Remember, if, I, if, if you recall a week or so ago, when I talked about the Old Testament prophets, when they prophesied, they didn't understand it all. They were looking at this thing from way off. Like I said, it's like looking down to the earth from a satellite. You just see different colors, masses of color, but they don't make any sense until you get closer and closer and closer until finally you get close enough you can actually see people walking around down here and, and cities and, and so on and so forth, buildings and all of that. Why? Because you got a different perspective. Well, their perspective was way off in the future, and they didn't understand it all. It was the same thing. I mean, you're looking at the earth through a satellite or through the lens of a camera on a satellite. You're seeing the same thing that you're seeing if you're just flying over at 100 feet in the air. It just doesn't look the same because it's a different perspective. Exactly. And that's why it sometimes looks like it's a, it's a contradiction when it's not at all. It's literally the same thing. It's just that they don't have the same vision, the same understanding or uh, revelation, if you will. So John, they're, 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 read, they're, they're looking at this and they're saying, Elijah's going to have to come back. Elijah. And Jesus is saying, you don't get it. This is a spirit. And John's bringing that spirit of Elijah to the earth. Amen. So John the Baptist came as a prophet. And he was preaching the kingdom of God is at hand, meaning it's here. All right? It's arrived. Now, the call, the call of any real prophet isn't all about predicting the future. But it's about calling people to turn to God. It's about the word of God. That's why Paul said, I would that you all prophesy. He didn't mean we all should go, hmm. I see a tall, dark stranger in your future. No, that's not what he was talking about. I would that you would all declare the word of God. I would that you would all turn, help to turn people to God. Help them to understand God is good. To repent of their feelings about God or their understanding of God or their, their uh, comprehension of God. And turn to receive the truth of God. Amen. Hallelujah. We've... We've narrowed our definition of prophecy to the ability to foretell the future. All right, Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Jesus came 
to tell them, church as usual ain't going to get it. You've been doing this for a thousand years. And unless I show up, you're no closer to God than you were before. It all points to me. It's all about God coming to them. Amen? And sadly, we could say the very same thing about religion in the world today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. This is Jesus. After John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee and now he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he's saying, the time's fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent or change your mind and believe the truth, the gospel. So Jesus comes into this divided, corrupted, earthly world into a culture that had been infiltrated and diluted by paganism, by pluralism, into an oppressed nation ruled by a foreign king, amen, and told everybody God's kingdom is coming now. Praise the Lord. And I'm the king. That's what he's saying. Now, if you want to be part of God's reforming nation, call it reformation, but he was reforming a nation is what he was trying to do. You're going to turn away from trusting the kingdom that you're in, trusting the kingdom that you can see and start following me into this invisible kingdom Praise the Lord. I love the United States of America. I spent four years of my life, 13 months of it in combat in Vietnam. I love this country or I wouldn't have done it. I'd have went to Canada Amen. or to Mexico or somewhere. But I'm not depending on this country to save my hide. Certainly not my soul. Praise the Lord. I'm not, I don't mean any disrespect to this country at all. I'm just saying, it is not, it doesn't have the answer outside of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So fast forward to now. I'm not sure that the church has shown that it knows what the kingdom of God is. I hear it. I hear it spoken a lot. I hear it talked about. I hear it referenced. But I'm not sure that we really know what it is. And I know that we've lost a lot of our focus on the gospel. All you got to do is turn on Christian television. Yes, churches do get bigger. But Christians are still as weak and anemic. Harvest fields are still unharvested. More numbers, but numbers doesn't mean anything to God. Amen. The gospel of the kingdom is the essence of Jesus' message. I mean, that tells me just simply that that ought to be the message. If it was his message, it ought to be our message. We ought to understand that message, right? Right? And if we lose sight of that message, or if we have lost sight of that message, it's possible we've lost sight of the messenger. Amen. Praise the Lord. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the stuff gets added to you. Praise God. See, here, the deal is, Jesus isn't as concerned with our agenda as he is with God's. What we need is real trust in the sheer power of the gospel. And I'm telling you, if you haven't been there yet, you're going to get there 
to where you're going to have to trust in something besides your goodness or your religion. You're going to have to trust in God. Yes. And it, it shouldn't get to that point. We should be able to walk in this reality because that's what the message is. Yes. Yes. Praise God. And it begins with a full embrace of the God of the universe and his finished work. Praise the Lord. We can make it really cool and kind of attractive, you know, in a fleshly way. But it's not accomplishing anything. Yeah. Might feel a little better, but we walk out with the same crap. We walk back out into the world with the same issues, with the same devils, with the same demons, with the same torments, and all of that because we're, we're not really operating in the kingdom. We're not really seeking first the kingdom. We're not really operating in the kingdom. We're talking about it a lot, but we're not really in it. Exactly. You can't really talk about Jesus' message without dealing with his announcement that the kingdom of God is here. Yes. It's at hand. Yes. Everywhere he went, just, if you just take a cursory look through the, the, the Gospels or, or just do a word study uh, on kingdom, Jesus is saying it over and over and over. That's what he is preaching every time he preaches now, yeah, the people are being healed, but his message is the kingdom has come. Yes, yes. Get in the kingdom. Yes. From beginning to the end of the Gospels, the idea that Jesus came to usher in the kingdom of God is at the forefront. It's the main focus. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't go around inviting people to say a prayer no. to get him to come no. to them. No. I'm not trying to be sarcastic or you know, ugly. I'm just saying that wasn't a message he had. No. He wasn't teaching them to pray a prayer so that Jesus would come live in their heart and they could be in him. He wasn't setting up a social justice system. He wasn't giving them 12-step programs. No. He went around proclaiming explicitly and implicitly, I mean, in their face and implying every way and any way that he could yeah. that this is the kingdom of God and it has come by him in him. Yes. That's what he was preaching. Yes. And he went on to demonstrate the realities of that kingdom yes. in a culture that only knew kingdoms of godlessness. They were that corrupt. Yeah. Look at Matthew chapter 3 uh, verses 1 through 3. I just want to show you something because there's always confusion about this, but Matthew's message was predominantly to Jewish believers or non-believers if you will. He was, he was writing to the Jews. Matthew was a Jew. He was a tax collector, but he, he was writing to Jewish people. Sometimes we get the context of these gospels kind of messed up and we don't get the vision that clearly but he said in those days came John the Baptist preaching the will in the wilderness of Judea and saying repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Elijah Elijah saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare you the way of the Lord make straight his path or make his path straight Matthew chapter 18 verse 3 I'm just showing you a few random spots in here because it is mingled in here at times where he'll say the kingdom of God but predominantly he's saying the kingdom of heaven so he said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. All right? Uh, chapter 20, verse 1. Still in Matthew. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder which went out early in the morning to, the labor, in, uh, to hire laborers into his vineyard. All right? Chapter 22, verse 2. kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. So, here's the deal. Heaven, in the context of the Gospels, I mean in, in terms of Jewish thought, or to use a big word, cosmology, which just simply means the way, the metaphysical understanding of how the universe is uh, created or, or designed. Amen. So, to them, in their way of thinking, 
heaven is not an outer space lounge with angels playing harps. It's a place where God lives. It's a place where God is. It's a dimension of God's tangible presence. So when Matthew is speaking to these Jewish people in the Gospel of Matthew, he speaks of the kingdom of heaven. Why? When he does speak of the kingdom of heaven, it's not referring to this place. Instead, it's, it's referring to this thing. The kingdom of God, this thing, which is just as real. Matthew, the reason for this is because the Jews considered it absolutely wrong and taboo and uh, sinful to speak or even write the name of God. Amen. To this day, Orthodox Jews will not speak it nor will they write it. So in deference to them, to the people that he's trying to reach, he uses it and says it's the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Are you following me? Instead of saying the kingdom of God, which would have offended them and made them mad and turned them off immediately, he refers to it as the kingdom of heaven. Amen. He just substitutes heaven for God. Amen? Because it's, it's where God is. See, You understand the connection here. In literary terms, that's called uh, circumlocution. In other words, it's just a way of saying what you want to say without saying it. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. In writing, you see it all the time. It's, it's a way of, you don't want to actually say the thing, but you want to get that out there. So that's what he's doing. Amen? So Matthew, when he's speaking, the kingdom of heaven is synonymous with the kingdom of God. It's the same thing. It's not two separate things. It's not two different deals. It's just his way of trying to say it without offending the audience that he's speaking to. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is not the place called heaven in some new location. Are you with me? It isn't like heaven has moved and now it's here on earth. That isn't what he was saying. It isn't just setting up heaven in a new location. The kingdom of God in the Gospels isn't, and listen to me, it is not a community of believers. It's not the church. It's not a place with borders or boundaries. So what's the kingdom of God? What is it? If it's not a place and it's not people, what can it be? The kingdom of God is the reign of God, the manifest presence of the sovereignty of God. It's not a place. It's not an institution. It's a status. It's a dynamic reality. Yes. Yes. Seek ye first yes. this reality, yes. this dynamic truth, amen, this, this status. Praise God. Jesus came to make the reign of God vitally present yes. or really real. Yes. Amen. Actually here. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Not a symbolic kingdom any more than he was a symbolic king. No. This is a real thing. It's a real reality. It's a yes. dynamic. It's a, it's a truth. And we're messing around and calling it all kinds of stuff. I mean, I'm not even going to go there, but you can just, you hear it all the time. And I'm thinking, my God, you, what, do you even have a clue what you're saying? Yes. We're just repeating stuff because it sounds spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to show you something. The practicality of this, you can't know this and not be spiritual. It's one reason why Jesus said, I, it always confused me when I was studying this. He says, uh, it, it came to my mind, I wasn't studying that particular scripture, but when I was studying for this, the, he, it reminded me of something that always bothered me, and that's where Jesus had said, look, we're not, I'm not telling these people the, the, this parable. It's not for them, it's for you, because I don't want them to know and then be saved. Yeah. I thought, well, that doesn't, that doesn't sound like God. That doesn't sound right at all. 
What he was saying was, if they see it, they'll understand the spiritual perspective of it. Because you can't know the, the, the practical without experiencing the spiritual of it. Praise the Lord. Look at Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 through 47. Daniel 2, 44 through 47. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to the king, what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Then the king, of, uh, king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Now that same imagery carries over into the Gospels. Look at Matthew chapter 21, verses 42 through 44. Remember, this is the kingdom that he's talking about. So Matthew 21, verse 42 through 44. Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is a marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind them to powder. Now the people that fall on the stone are the people that come to the kingdom, have been given power to rule in that kingdom. I just read it to you. And we've been doing church and not ruling. We've been doing everything except what we're supposed to be doing. Matthew 11, uh, verses 12 through 15. Because you see, you don't have to be religious for this. In fact, it might be beneficial if you weren't. Because the less baggage you got, the less you got to unload to get to where it is God's trying to get us to. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. I'd say what we just read in Daniel 2 and Matthew 17 sounds pretty violent to me. It's people being ground to powder or being broken as they fall on it or kingdoms being totally destroyed. Right. Amen. So he says the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets of the law prophesied until John, and if you, if you will receive it, this is Elijah which was to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. The kingdom comes into this kingdom, and it smashes up world views, yes, it does. values, yes. belief systems, yes. cultures. Yes. It tears apart the bondage of what people are in bondage to because of sin, because of Satan. The kingdom literally wreaks havoc among those who oppose it. Jesus makes sick people well. The paralyzed, amen, get up and walk. The dead live. The captives are released. Demons are cast out. Just like any new king, he's issuing pardons for this kingdom. We got it backwards. Our presidents always issue all kinds of pardons just before they leave office. Amen. To take care of those that have taken care of them, praise God. But it happens every election cycle. But this is kingdom kind of stuff. 
the new king comes and he starts issuing pardons because he wants to be on a on a good basis with everybody. He wants them to know, I am a good king. I'm a king that loves his people, that's going to take care of them, that's going to provide for them. So he just starts issuing pardons by healing and delivering and casting out demons and doing all the things that Jesus did when he went about preaching the kingdom. We're supposed to live in this kingdom. We're supposed to rule and reign in that kingdom. And we do it by believing different. We do it by trusting different. We do it by hoping different. We do it by loving different. And so a result is we live different. See, believers are not a subculture. That's kind of what we've resigned ourselves to. We're not a subculture. We are a counterculture. Praise God. It's so upside down, it's crazy. Which is why it's so revolutionary. Which is why when I look at religion, I think, I don't know what that is, but it isn't this. It isn't the kingdom. It's not revolutionary. It's trying to figure out some way to conform somewhere to fit into the system, into the cultures, into the stuff, into the mess that we're already dealing with when we're supposed to be the opposite of that. The reason we don't have our deliverance, the reason we don't get healed, the reason we don't get all the things we get, the, the reason we get any of it is simply by the goodness and the mercy of God, but the reason we're not consistent in any of those things is because we're in the world and we're living like the world just trying to be better. And that's not the way it's supposed to work. We're supposed to operate in the kingdom. And to operate in the kingdom, you've got to look at this world differently. You can't put your confidence in everything you see and every report you hear. You can't. Because if you are, you're not in the kingdom. Here's what I was talking about earlier. You see, the kingdom of God can't be grasped practically. Without grasping it spiritually. In other words, you can't get this intellectually. No. That's why I said months back, I was preaching. I said, look, one of the things God told me was about, you know, you got to put that Bible down. When you pick it up, read it like it's the first time you've ever read it before. Mm-hmm. Which means you have to do some intellectual repenting. Sure. you got to quit thinking the way you've always thought and the way that makes sense. There has to be some changing in the way that you think in order to read this any differently than you've ever read it. Sure. Because that stuff's all there. It's programmed into our memory, in, into our uh, mind. Even though it may not be conscious, it's still there and it still influences our conscience. Yes, so this is what I'm saying. The kingdom of God, you can't grasp your healing. You can't get the physical, practical reality of this thing if you don't understand the spiritual re- reality of it. If you get one, you'll get the other. Amen. You get a healing, praise the Lord, you'll have some revelation. Yes. God will all of a sudden be different than he was before. Yes. Get a deliverance. Have a miracle take place, and all of a sudden God is more real than he's ever been before. Not that he is any different or any more real, but to you, you grasp something practical that made the spiritual just blow up right in your face and become more real than it had ever been before. That's being in the kingdom. That's where we've got to operate from. Amen. We cannot continue to just do stuff and think it's going to, if I get enough information, it'll get better. Listen, the devil has way more information than we're ever going to have. Yeah. But he has no revelation. No. So he's defeated. Amen. Defeated, not because he's got all this information. He's defeated because of a little revelation. But when we operate in information, we're at his mercy. Because he's got more than you have. Yes. Yes. It's only when you operate in the spirit. You don't walk in the spirit and you overcome the enemy. When you're operating through the kingdom of God, you have the victory over the devil because he has no revelation there. He has no understanding of that. He has to operate in this sense realm yes, where information rules. He wants to drag us out there. That's why he does it with, oh, man, I got this feeling. 
I'm this age, so now this is going to happen. Or, you know, this thing happened in a relationship, so now I, the result's going to be this. Or, or the devil's been on me, for so i got to just, you know, cower and give in. I'm not I'm trying to be cruel about it. I'm telling you, I get the same thoughts. I have the same feelings. Sally will tell you. There's a lot of times I just don't, I don't really want to come to church. Because I've been fighting the devil too. And he's trying to convince me that he's, he won. Yeah. Or I'll come to church and I'll preach and then by 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm convinced that that was, I, I've just ruined everybody's lives forever. <laughs> Amen. You think, I, you think that's, I, I'm telling you, I can be so depressed after a good service. Yeah. It only takes a couple hours yeah. for the enemy to just start bringing out everything that I said and how I said it and where I said it and how, how they could have misunderstood that or they might have thought you meant this or they might have thought you were trying to be, cruel or you were doing this or doing that or you misquoted that and now God's going to be mad because you, you know you corrupted the word I mean come on yeah. if you give in to it you're done yeah. but if you don't if you just stand up and fight back yeah. you're victorious yes. you're victorious simply by not giving in Amen. Yeah. that's true of healing it's true for every area in the spirit you resist the devil. Yes. And he will flee eventually. Yes. Doesn't mean he won't come back. If he comes back, you've got to resist him again. Yes. Praise God. So, grasp it practically, and you, you will grasp it spiritually. You can't do one without seeing the other. Amen. Think about it. We believe. We look at things that are not as though they are. So if you operate by the spirit, you see it, you know, in your spirit. I'm not talking about you have a vision necessarily, but you see it. You just mm -hmm. believe it. Yeah. It manifests. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you, you have both. Or if you see the healing, now you know this was the Lord. Because you already got the doctor's report. You've already been living with this mess. Or whatever it might be. Finances, whatever else it is. Okay? So they're the same. That's what I'm saying. You can't have one without the other. You, you get the practical, the spiritual is right there. You get the spiritual, the practical will show up the same. Yes, it will. Yes. It requires being set free by God for this to happen. And that's what Jesus came to do. Yes. Remember? He, he, he gives us new eyes to see. He gives us new ears to hear. Without new ears to hear? Well, I'll tell you, just share some of this with some unbeliever. You're stupid. You're naive. You're an idiot to believe stuff like that. It's like fingernails on a chalkboard to them. Why? Because they don't have ears to hear. To us, it's well, that makes perfect sense. Say it to them and they think you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Look at Colossians. Okay, Colossians chapter 1. We're about done. Colossians chapter 1, uh, 15 through 23. Is anybody warm? I turned that heat or the air back up to 72 thinking it was going to be comfortable. But maybe it's just me then. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Colossians 1, 15 through 23. So who is... Now, he's, he's not asking a question. He's talking about the Lord Jesus. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth nor things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue... 
in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which is the kingdom, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So the first part of this uh, scripture here in Colossians speaks of Christ as God, the sovereign power of the universe, right? And then the second part speaks to this almighty God becoming a human king to fill his kingdom with lost family members. Praise the Lord. That's what he's doing. That's what this is all about. We are kings and priests in this kingdom. You have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Time's coming, everything's going to get shook. All kingdoms are going to be shaken, but one. Amen. If you're not in that kingdom, you're going to feel the shaking. Now, I'm not saying uh, you're not saved. I'm saying in that kingdom, the shaking is going to bother you. You're going to have confidence in the kingdom that you're in. Because that king pardons, he delivers, he prospers, he provides for, he does whatever the need is, he meets that need. If it's healing, he's there to heal. If, if it's deliverance, he's there to deliver. If it's uh, finances, he's there to give you. If, whatever it is, within the kingdom, this king is a, a good king, a beneficent king, a king that gives and blesses and, and, and does good for his people. Amen. So, when this kingdom manifests, and this is what I believe he's talking about when it says, oh, the whole earth groans and moans for the manifestation of the sons of God, for this kingdom to begin to rule and to, to dominate. Yeah. Praise the Lord. When that happens, when this kingdom manifests completely, which is our job, mm -hmm. seek the kingdom, be operating from the kingdom, then the full-fledged, fall-on-your-face glory of God will be revealed. And it won't be because we had a big meeting somewhere. No. Amen. I mean, I'm not against big meetings. I'm just saying that's not how it's going to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen when the people of God start operating the way God intended us to operate in the kingdom of God and stop playing church and start being the church. Yes. Amen. And people will fall out before the presence of God. Yes, Praise God. We're part of a kingdom that will demolish all pretenders. The devil is the king of this natural realm. King of the air. King on the earth. A little K, but that's what, his, that's what his title is. Or one of them at least. We'll demolish the pretenders and we'll fulfill the promises of God. Praise the Lord. When the promises of God are fulfilled... People will be redeemed. And that's already sealed for us. Praise the Lord. All right, back to Malachi 4 again. Let's read this one more time. Malachi 4, 1 through 6. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And, that day, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you will go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. That's, you know, got ever raised calves in the stall? That means because they're being taken care of every day by somebody. They're being fed, they're being watered, they're being groomed, all that's taken care of for them. You shall tread down the wicked. You shall tread down the wicked. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgment. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So which outcome are we preparing for? No fear. No reason to fear in the kingdom. No. And we watch CNN and we watch Fox News. And if you watch 
more than 10 minutes of it, if you're not afraid, you're in a coma. <laughs> because it's all bad stuff. And you can just turn it to 13 and 8, and you've got this young girl get, shoots herself. Over here, they're shooting each other. Out in the country, doesn't matter where it is, they're shooting family members, they're kill, killing. It's scary. Yeah. It's frightening. But in the kingdom, yeah. you're protected. Amen. You're provided for. And though everything else may go into, go into hell in a handbasket, you don't have to get in the basket. You don't have to fear what is coming on the earth. Because junk is coming on the earth. And it's been coming for a long time. But we can't live with our focus you know, on the negative stuff that's happening and be afraid. I'm not saying we shouldn't pray against it, that we shouldn't declare, amen, uh, our authority over those situations. But I'm saying you cannot live in fear and expect to have any kind of an impact on the, on the culture around us. The culture is affecting us. Yep. Praise God. Ephesians, last scripture. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 through 21. See, we're asking people to give up the party life, you know, the high life. Praise the Lord. Give up this, give up that, and, you know, it'll all be better. And for what? For an institution? For a different set of rules? Hey, if I'm going to be, you know, thought bad of or ridiculed, I want it to be for something that's real. It was real to the apostles. It was real to the disciples. That's why they were willing to give their life for it. I wonder how many of the megachurch people are willing to give their life for a faith that isn't even really theirs. I'm not judging. I'm not saying who is and who isn't saved. I'm just saying if it's just how many people you get in the building, Wells Fargo Center down here would be one of the Greatest temples in Iowa. Praise the Lord. Get enough entertainment, enough programs, enough stuff, and you can get people. People need to be saved. People need access to the kingdom, not to my denomination or my religion or my particular way of looking at life. We need to see it the way Jesus sees it, or we're all wasting time. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church. That not that the church will know, but that the principalities and powers in heavenly places will know by the church. By us. The devil is going to know his situation, his circumstance, and what it is by me. By what I declare. By how I operate. Amen. The manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in, Christ, in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, that's a kingdom worth spending your life on. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's a kingdom worth selling everything for. <laughs> including our well-intended religious traditions that have been corrupted by our culture and diluted by our lack of trust in the invisible kingdom of God, which is the true spirit realm. Amen. Praise the Lord. So today is the day of salvation. Today is the great and awesome day of the Lord. Amen.
think we're preparing for it. Stop trusting in what you can see. Follow Jesus into the invisible, sovereign kingdom of God. The true spiritual realm. The true supernatural realm. Or prepare for a religion and a huge disappointment. An ongoing disappointment. We need to hope different. We need to think different. We need to believe different. We need to operate different to get a different result. Mm -hmm. And our focus has to be on the kingdom of God and not this world. This world is not my home. Amen? And I don't have to die to get to my home. The kingdom is my home. And it's right here. If I'll pursue it, if I'll stop allowing the influences of this world, this kingdom, to affect me, then I can start affecting it from the kingdom that God has placed us in. It takes discipline. It isn't just an easy fix. You don't just come here and we get a prophet to come in or some minister or somebody else to come in and just wave their hand over you and say, now you'll never have any more problems. Amen? doesn't work that way. They can help you to believe, to have greater confidence in the word of God. But we've got to quit looking for men. Amen? The only guy that really interested me was Elijah. John the Baptist, who came and said, okay, this is, that, this is over. Here comes what you're looking for. Here comes the answer to all of your problems and your issues. Amen? It's Jesus. He is and has the kingdom of God. Amen? And whatever's shaken will stop shaking when you get into that kingdom, when you make that your focus. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have stuff. It just means you're not going to let it dominate you and dictate to you what your outcome is. You do the dictating. You do the, the, the de declarations. You do the declaring from your position in the kingdom of God. Church, we got to do this. I'm just, I'm just telling you. It's, look, we're going to see some dramatic things, awesome things, powerful things from God. Not the world will have their stuff, and that's just the way it is. But I'm not, I'm, that's not my focus. I'm looking for that great and awesome day of the Lord to begin to shine brighter and brighter and brighter in this darkness, amen, that we call a kingdom, amen, which is the world. Praise the Lord. And if we're not willing to do it, then you need to find yourself a nice Presbyterian church someplace where you can just go and feel comfortable because you did what you should do and you went on Sunday. I'm not being, I've got family that go to Presbyterian Church. Please, I hope this, no, this is going out over there. So, well, never mind. Uh, but I'm just saying. I, I'm just saying, if that's what you want, then that's where you need to be because I'm not interested anymore in just doing the stuff we've always done. I'm not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and I'm not against, you know, charismatic and Pentecostal kind of ways of, uh, of, of reaching out. I'm, I'm not against all of that. I'm just saying, we need to get the facts straight. Yes. God didn't expect us to come in here and just check your brain at the door and just come in here with your feelings now and just do your feeling. Yeah. He expects us to think. He gave us the mind of Christ. Yes. And if we're, if we're not going to take advantage of that, if we're not going to use it in a way that's beneficial, not only for us but for others, then we're wasting our time. Yes. And I mean that. I'm, I'm sincere. It's just it's a waste of time. So let's, you know, man up, woman up, yes. God up. Let's yes. be who we really are, and let's start taking some territory back for the Lord. Let's start expanding the kingdom of God Amen. and diminishing this mess that's all around us. Exactly. We're the only ones that can do it. Amen. You say praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Praise, praise God. You got it. You got to. You got to discipline, because. Everything is against this. Everything in the natural is against this. You walk out those doors and reality is going to slap you right across the face. Amen? I mean, I'm talking about the world's reality. If you don't have a stronger reality, it'll knock you sideways. 
It'll get you off of your foundation. Praise the Lord. He has made us more than conquerors. But we've got to operate by his principles. You can't just, you can't just ad lib this and think you're going to get away with it. It won't work. Praise God. You, you better get you a foundation that is more than just a shout. I'm not against shouting. I shout as quick as anybody. But I'm just saying. You better have something behind that. Or the devil will come find out what you got. Amen. I heard someone say this today. This ought to be so good you'd slap your mama. I mean, it's, you know, like they talk about a really good dessert. It'll make you slap your mama. <laughs> this ought to be that good. Yes. It'll make you do something crazy. Yes. You don't slap my mama because she slapped back bad. I mean, <laughs> she let you have it quick. But I'm just saying it ought to make us do some stuff that just isn't natural. Right? right? Amen. All right. I'll leave you alone. Praise God. God bless all of you. Darlene. That's exactly right. It's ours. The kingdom is ours. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Go in that kingdom. God bless you. You're all dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great week.